here in John chapter 3, I'm sorry, 3rd John chapter 1 rather. As you noticed in your bulletin, we actually have that on the first part of the bulletin. And I want to talk about health this morning, but from a different angle, a different perspective. If you'll notice, uh, those that decorated the bulletin for us put all sorts of um, healthy herbs and flowers. That, that is an echinacea flower on the front of the bulletin. How cool is that? So if you didn't know echinacea was a flower, there it is. And it's something that actually helps our body. And so I want to talk about some things that can help our body and our spirit and our soul. We're going to have a theme for the next month, a theme of health, generally speaking. But health is a broad spectrum. I wish that I could say that those that are in good health, it's simply because of what they had for breakfast. You know, did you have fast food or do you have farm fresh eggs? That makes all the difference. Well, no, there's a little bit more to it than that. There certainly is. Um, I want to show you some really neat stuff out of this chapter, a couple verses. Starting in verse number one, if you'll notice with me, it says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. Now, here he says he is well-beloved. He said, this is somebody that we really like, a lot of favor. We really appreciate this person. He says, well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. You know what it means to love somebody in the truth? Now, who is the truth? Well, obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we are called to love the brethren. We are called to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're in the Lord, if you're in Christ, I should love you. And sometimes when I'm talking to some of the men over the phone, I tell them, I love you. In Christ is what I mean. And what we're saying is that we ought to have a brotherly love based in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they say you can't pick your family. And we should love our family. But boy, there's some folks probably in your extended family, you just say, I don't know, it's kind of hard to love them. But as Christians, as brothers and sisters for eternity, while we're on the earth, the world is judging us on how we love each other. By this shall all men know that you have, that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. John 13, 35. So the people outside of the church look inside of the church at how we love each other to see how close we are to God. And that really is an indication because the more that you love God, the more that you should love God's people and you should care for them. And I want to point out here, he says, he, he is well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, or in Christ, if you will. Uh, verse 2, beloved. There, I mean, that, that's three times he says, I love this guy. I really love this guy. He, he encourages me. Now, I want you to think about this. If you have brotherly love or sisterly love for those that are in Christ as we work together as teammates for the Lord's agenda on earth, what type of things should we care about in other people's lives? What type of prayers should we have for one another? If you look at the next part of the verse, he says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Think about this. Man, I love this guy. I love him in Christ. He's my beloved like a brother. And you know what I really want for him? I want him to have a healthy life in his body. I want him to have a good spirit, if you will. I want him to be healthy all the way around. We often, you know, give health advice to one another. Uh, and if I may, Brother Paul, we were talking before the service, and something, something he had going on, I, I don't know if it was a respiratory, but I said, I always recommend oil, uh, oil of oregano for everything. Like, it's the miracle cure, you know, like, that's my go-to, you know, because uh, it's it, antiseptic, antichloral, antifungal, antimicrobial. It's got all these amazing properties. We see in the Old Testament, they were told to take a branch of hyssop. That's Mediterranean oregano, as we understand it on the market. Uh, it cures candida and cancer. Cure, oh, you're not allowed to say that. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, it does a lot of cool things. And so I was talking with him. You should try this for that thing that, you know, I think it was respiratory, if I'm not mistaken, or sinus or something. And, uh, but he came in this morning, and we were talking a little bit. And he said, well, let me tell you this. Don't put oil of oregano in your ear. <laughs> now, now, amen. Now, that's probably some good advice. And I will tell you, if you've ever taken oil of oregano, you put a few drops on your tongue, it will light you up, won't it? I mean, you 
you start getting, you start like breathing a little better and it starts to just really work as it detoxifies your system a little bit. And, you know, I gave him that advice because I love him in Christ and I want to see him thrive while he's here. I want to see him live as long as God has for him in a healthy way so that we can carry this burden together as we serve the Lord all of our days. And that goes not with just Brother Paul. I love you, Brother Paul. I love you, Brother Chad. I love you, Brother Harry. I love you, Brother John. Hey, I love you, Sister Sylvia. I love you, Sister Norma Jean. Like, I love our church. I love the people of our church. And you look at this prayer here. He says, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then he says, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. What an interesting statement of love. What an expression of love that he's saying, I want to see you to be successful. He goes a little bit farther. If you notice the end of the verse, this is so important. This is the key. Even as thy soul prospereth. What a statement. He knows this man well enough that he already has the prosperity of his soul, if you will. But he says, I want these same blessings for your whole life. You ever feel where, man, my spirit is down, my spirit is broken or discouraged or distraught, I'm just frustrated or vexed? You know, God made you a three-part being. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. There's three parts to you, just as there are three in heaven. These three are one. You're one person, but you are expressed on this earth in three ways. And when your spirit is broken, it can actually affect your flesh. That's what Proverbs tells us. His goal here, he says, I love you. I love this guy. I love him in the truth. I love what he's doing. His soul is prospering. And now I want him to be able to prosper in the other areas of his life. We often think of prosperity as riches, don't we? Or wealth. And there is that definition, but that's not really all that it's talking about. I don't want to limit it to wealth and health. This is not prosperity preaching and believe in Jesus and your whole life will be good and your bank account will go up and you'll never get sick. That's bogus. That whole name it and claim it Pentecostal movement, you know, that's fake. That's not real. Now, there are spiritual powers that we have. We're called to pray for one another and love one another. And we're warned about when we're down in our spirit, we have a tendency to, guess what? It affects your flesh and your health. You have three parts He says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. You say, what is prosperity? Well, it's wealth, kind of, but it's really more success. And I'll tell you, my definition of success is probably different than yours. My race in this life for the Lord is different than your race and your ministry. How do I know I've crossed the finish line? And when I pass away, I can say I was successful for the Lord. A a prosperous journey. There's a phrase, a prosperous journey. This life you have on the earth, God has a goal for you. And you know what happens? We get distracted. We get down and discouraged and defunct. And we're just, I don't know, man, those things are just horrible. You don't know how bad I have it. Really? Can't you give me 10 reasons that God's been good to you? Well, I could, but I don't want to. (laughs) Now listen, we're we're a three-part being, and it all affects. One literally affects the other. So we're going to talk about some of this over the next month. And I I, I really want to, so what is prosperity? Well, it's to be successful or have a prosperity, prosperous journey to get the blessings that God has for me so that when I see God face to face, he would say, well done, thou good and, listen, profitable servant. That's true. Prosperity is being profitable with the talents and gifts that God's giving you, using them for the Lord. And he says, hey, that was a good investment. God forbid any of us should get up to heaven. And he says, I gave you this and I gave you that. And I told you how to do this. And you didn't do none of it. And you did this wrong and you messed that up. Woe unto us. Rather, we want to be profitable unto the Lord. We want to add to the Lord. He says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health. You say, what is good health? What is good health? What does that look like? Able to thrive, able to grow, continuously growing, able to think and have control over your body. Some people can't control every area of their body. Having mobility, able to get up and go and move and things like that. I mean, this is important. 
I want to talk about this phrase, he says, as thy soul prospereth, at the end of this verse. This morning I want to focus on soul prosperity, or soul health. And I want to ask you the question, is your soul prosperous in God's eyes? Would you say, if you evaluated yourself, that my soul is healthy? I went to the doctor this week, he brought out the Soul Scanner 2000, and he took a good look, and boop, boop, and he said, hey, whoa, I see something you got going on here, we need to fix that problem. Is your soul healthy? Is it vital? Is it living? Now, I believe in the simplest form that the essence of health is life and vitality, which would mean when he says, as thy soul prosperous, he's saying, I already know you're saved, and I see God working in you. I believe your name is written in the book of life. And as he says in Revelation 3, and, and no man will blot it out. He says, I know that your soul is prospering, but now I'm worried about the rest of your life. I want to see your life prosper. One definitely affects the other. If your body is hurting, it's hard to think, right? Or if your spirit is down because you're not close to the Lord, you're not renewing your strength in the Word of God, well, then it's kind of hard to speak up and to be encouraged or to do certain things. Maybe your brain doesn't work right, or maybe your spirit has been wounded, and it just kind of makes it difficult to reach out to a lost soul and tell them of the love of God, doesn't it? All these things, one affects the other. What is good health? Good health is to be able to be independent. If you brought yourself to church today, this morning, and you were able to get up on your own and move around, and you can communicate on your own, and you can comprehend what's being said, and you can recall memories from the past, I would say, in a general sense, hey, you're somewhat healthy. You have some health to be thankful for from the Lord, right? Maybe good vision. I know there's a few people right now fighting this fight of vision. Good vision would be healthy. I'm looking forward to the resurrection. I tell you what, man, we're going to get a new body. Until then, we get to suffer. Having good vision is an essential part of good health. Hearing, being able to hear what's being said and be able to comprehend it, that's super important. That is extremely valuable. Having good blood pressure, having good circulation in your system. These are important things. Sometimes people get to the end of their life and they've spent all their time making money and they get to the end of their life and they begin to lose their health and they're willing to spend all their money to get a little more time on the earth. I want you to be in good health. I want you to be prosperous. Maybe we have some habits in the flesh that are withholding our spirit. Did you know that if I have a bad habit in the flesh, it could actually prevent me from growing spiritually or helping others grow? Sometimes we make substitutions in what we put in our body that are just not good. I was on the way to work the other day, and I was running low on gas, and I stopped by the gas station. All the pumps were full. So I just went in, and I bought a gallon of that sweet drink that they sell. It was like two bottles for three bucks. I put it in the tank, and man, it ran just fine. Sputtered a little bit, but I think I'm just going to switch to that instead of gasoline, and I'm pretty sure things will be okay. <laughs> you say, you've lost your mind. You don't want to put that in your engine. Well, you're putting it in your body, right? I mean, there are some things that we allow in our body that, frankly, we know we, know we ought not, and then we kind of justify it, and maybe the Holy Spirit wants to draw you and show you there are some areas. I mean, hey, having good nutrition is an essential part of good health. Garbage in, garbage out. And guess what? That goes for your mind. What kind of music are you listening to because it's teaching you doctrine? It's teaching you to worship something or somebody. What type of videos do you allow your eyes to feast upon? Because it's going to affect your heart. And then it will affect the words that come out of your mouth. Garbage in, garbage out. I'm not just talking about the body. You know, in your body, though, isn't it nice to be able to have dexterity? 
and agility and movement and flexibility. I was talking with Sister Sally earlier. She's struggling with one of her hands. And boy, there's times I wake up and I'm just like, man, I, my hand feels so inflamed. I got to rub them and get them going, kind of crank it up for the day. Now imagine, now imagine that on a tenfold magnitude. And when, you, when we get older and it's like, oh man, I can't move. <laughs> Snap, crackle, pop, you know, before I get out of the bed. Isn't Health isn't good health defined by having these abilities that are gifts from God. And you know what? It turns out we're all dying in here. Although we're growing, we're ultimately dying. And we, we know what our fate is in the flesh here. We're going to die. Now, he has a desire that we would uh, be healthy and prosperous in our spirit as well. Not having this inflammation of the spirit, right? <laughs> Being able to breathe. That's a very big gift from God. If you don't believe me, just have lung problems and you'll find out real quick. It affects everything. You can't see straight. You got a headache. You can't read. Having the sense of touch to know when you're having feeling and know if it's hot or cold. These are senses that some of us take for granted because we've never had to question them. As he's writing this letter to his friend that he loves in the Lord, he says, I want you to read it again. He says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. I wish that your body was strong. I wish that you had, were on a successful journey on your body, soul, and spirit. All three are included here. And he says, he ends, but as thy soul prospereth. Well, what is soul prosperity? How can I measure myself and see how my soul is doing? Is my soul healthy and living? How can I find out? Notice what he says in the next verse, verse number three. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Now again, Jesus Christ is the way to heaven, the truth and the life. We are sanctified by his word. His word is truth. He says, you have the truth. He's, tell, he's saying, he's got Jesus. He's saved. This is a man that has zero doubts about his eternal destiny. He knows for a fact he's trusted on the Lord. And God's promise was of everlasting life. And he says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has made a promise. He'll never lie. He says, you want the gift of God, which is eternal life? Hey, just take the gift. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This man did that. He has the truth in him. But then he goes a step farther. Now that he's saved, you know what he's doing? He's walking in the truth. God's will for your life is first that you get saved, then that you do what he says. And don't put those two backwards. Well, I've been trying. I talked to a guy yesterday out soul winning. Man, this guy was so mixed up and turned around. He would say one thing, and literally two minutes later, he was contradicting himself. Well, I know that I'm going to heaven. I'm pretty good. I take care of most people. And it's like, no, 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 stop. That's not what the Bible says. Really? Wow. Huh. Well, show me. And then I'd read the verse. And go, yeah, amen, amen. It's all Jesus. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. Is it by your works or is it by Jesus? Well, Jesus, that's what you just showed me. Is there anything you can do to lose it? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you don't do the works. And I said, so you don't believe Jesus died for those sins? Huh. Well, no, he died for him. It was interesting how this man was so confused because he did not have the foundation of truth. He did not have a foundation on the Word of God. He did not believe that God's Word was true and unchangeable. And, and you know, well, what about the Bible? Isn't there different versions? Yes, there is, and I'm glad you asked that. What a great question. And you know what? This is the one that's not missing any versions. This is the one that hasn't been changed by the Catholics. This is the one that doesn't take away the title, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have God's perfect Word. We don't need to rewrite it. We need to reread it. And we need to stand on what we have. This man, Gaius, he said, he, he testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. You know, we're called to walk in truth. We're called to walk in light. And Jesus, you know what he hates more than anything else, I think? When his children are hypocrites. I really think that disappoints him. I do. We ought to walk in the truth. We ought to live for the truth. If you would go to Hebrews chapter 10, go back a, just a few passages. Go to Hebrews chapter number 10. 
And you say, how can I know for sure that my soul is prospering as this man? It said his soul prospereth. He says he's already got it figured out. How can I know for sure uh, what my, that my soul is prospering? And I'll tell you real easy, uh, get saved. There are probably some people in here today that are not saved. I do not automatically assume that you, just because you show up to church, that you're already saved. I would like to give you the benefit of the doubt, and uh, I want to hear you out, but there, some people will come and they say, well, I know I'm a pretty good person. Well, that won't get you anywhere, because we're not good enough. We're all going to fall short. We have to stop trusting in ourselves and understand, I've got to give it all to God. I've got to give all of my faith on Him, not trust in myself to keep living a righteous life. Now, I am still saying you should live a righteous life. I'm not saying go and live like hell, but I want you to understand, stop trusting in your works and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's finished the work already, and He's offering you a free gift. It's called everlasting life, and it lasts forever. It's free. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful promise that God loves you so much. Even though while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Every one of you, I look out. Oh, man, I see a bunch of sinners here. Yeah, and you could hold a mirror back at me. Say, yeah, you too, Pastor. This old man is still present with us. I'm in this body of sin, this flesh. And we need to fight it every day. And we need to fight the good fight of faith. And we need to put on a warfare to stop the wiles of devil and, and the temptations of the flesh. And we need to work for the Lord while there's time. I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 10. I want to talk about salvation. Hebrews 10, look at verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. This man that we're reading about in 3 John, it says that his soul prospereth. How? He believed to the saving of the soul. It was done. Uh, go to James. Flip a couple pages and go to James chapter 1. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your soul is saved forever. That's his promise. You don't have to do any work to keep your salvation. But let me tell you this. If you decide to live like hell, you can expect a correction from your father because he loves you and he doesn't want you to be a hypocrite. And he will straighten you out in love. In, in, in James chapter 1, look at verse 21. James chapter 1 verse 21 Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. What a statement. It is the word of God that's able to save your soul. And then once you get it and you believe it and you're saved, you know what you ought to do? Well, he says, uh, get rid of the filthiness in your life and all the superfluous things, the pointless, fluffy things in life. Just get rid of it. It's pointless. We let pointless things become idols in our life and become more important than what really matters. Well, I can't come to church. I got to watch the pregame show. They might have one of those telecasters that tells us who's going to win next year or something. I mean, we really have put sports way above God for many years. Go to 1 Peter 1. Keep flipping. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, when you get there, find verse number 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What is my faith for? Well, it's in Christ. Yeah, but what is it for? It's for the salvation of my soul. He's made a promise. Go to Matthew chapter 10, please. Listen, I just want to tell you that Jesus has finished the work. He has completed it. We trust in Him. His Word is where we hear the testimony. And through the hearing of the Word, we believe on Him. And by our faith, He's going to finish the work of saving our soul. But that's not a guarantee that your body will stop sinning. In fact, quite the opposite. I really believe sometimes when people get saved, boy, the devil really puts it on thick. He likes to attack and discourage and tempt and try and try to get you to be offended and say, I'm done with the Christian life. I really believe the devil wants to trip you up and cause you to say, oh, I don't need that church. It's full of a bunch of sinners and hypocrites. And I would say, well, amen. We got room for one more. Come on in. <laughs> 
We're all sinners. We all have problems. No one can stop sinning completely. There is no such thing as a sinless perfection. If there was, we wouldn't need Jesus. Now, He gives you the Holy Spirit that moves inside of you. And, you know, if I came to your house, I knocked on the door and said, Hey, I'm moving in. Give me a key. I'm going to come and go as I want. And, uh, whoa, wait a minute. What do you got in here? And I picked on Larry one time talking about this. I said, You got those ACDC posters on your wall. You got to tear those things down. You know, you got to get rid of your rock and roll posters. <laughs> I love picking on Brother Larry. He said, All of them? If I came into your house and I was going to move in and I was going to make that my abode and I say, hey guys, there are some things in here that I want to change. You haven't painted this wall in 20 years. It's time to clean it up. I don't really like these decorations. They kind of grieve me a little. Can we get rid of them and put something a little more holy and sanctified up? That's what happens when you get saved. The Holy Spirit moves inside of you. And listen, there are things that should accompany salvation, but many Christians are hard-hearted and stiff-necked. Many will get saved and they begin that path of growth and then they hit a wall. They get offended. They get out of church. They get out of the Word of God. They quit hanging out with Christians and where do they fall? Well, back with their old friends. Then they go through a season of life, a season of sin, and it's pleasurable for a season until the Holy Spirit grieves them and takes the joy out of their sin. And all of a sudden, they're standing in the middle of the party, and it's like, what am I doing here? These aren't my people. This isn't fun. This is not what I'm called to do. God will give you the Holy Spirit at the moment you believe to help lead you and guide you into all truth. And the more that you embrace the Lord and pray to the Holy Spirit and read His Word, the more you understand His will for your life. And then the more you submit to the will, greater things go. And I don't just mean physically prosperity. I mean your spiritual prosperity will grow. And you'll be able to endure things more. And you'll be able to understand things more. Spiritual growth is a process. Salvation is a one-time thing. You're in Matthew 10. I want you to see this. I want to talk about, I talked about salvation of the soul by faith through the Word of God. Now I want to talk about service. God has a plan for you. Uh, look at verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now that you're saved, you're eternally secure. God has you. He's got your soul. He made a promise. But then here's what happens. We get around other people and we're embarrassed. We're ashamed. We don't want to speak up. The application of this verse, can you imagine that, you know, there are Christians that are in heaven right now that laid their life down. They were physically tortured in the most peculiar, obscene ways. Can you imagine somebody cutting off your fingers and saying, say that Jesus doesn't exist? Can you imagine somebody pulling your teeth out one by one? Deny Jesus! Can you imagine somebody being sawn in half? Just deny Jesus and we'll stop. We'll make it easy on you. It won't hurt anymore. This verse tells us in verse 28, he says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. I want you to understand, there is no human being on this earth that can take your soul. A lot of Catholics are hung up. They think that suicide is an unforgivable sin. If I kill this body, it does not change the destination of my soul. It's a sin to, for me to kill this body as much as it is to kill another body. But when my soul is saved, it's eternally secure. It's sealed to the day of redemption. I shouldn't fear people that can kill my body. If we in America actually go through a time of persecution where religions that hate Christianity... And I mean the rest of them in the world. Catholics, Muslims, Mormons, Judaism, Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it. They all hate Christians. That's the one thing that they hate the most. And if they make a law where they can persecute Christians, will you fear the people that can kill your body? Or will you fear the only one that could kill your soul? 
Because if God brings you to the torture stake, I believe he's doing it for a witness and a testimony to those that would kill you. Just as the centurion that was present when everything happened at the cross, finally he said, surely this was the Son of God. What a testimony. Go to the next chapter, Matthew 11. I want to talk about service. Once you're saved, you should serve the Lord with your life. Matthew 11, find verse number 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. I want to tell you if you're troubled or vexed in your spirit, if you have a broken or a wounded spirit today, I want to tell you, take the yoke of discipleship upon yourself. And as Jesus Christ did through meekness and humility, he went and served others. If you will do the same thing as we serve Christ, you will find rest unto your soul. You just don't know. I'm troubled. Well, let me tell you what to do. Go help someone that's troubled. Go preach the gospel to the lost. Go to Matthew 16, if you would. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Is your soul prospering? Is your soul healthy? That's the question. We're going to answer the questions over the next month, Lord willing, about your body, soul, and spirit. And they're all three tied together. They're very closely related. In fact, the spirit and the soul sometimes are almost indistinguishable where you read a verse and you're like, oh, that's talking about the soul. And you're like, oh, that one's talking about the spirit. They're very close and similar, but there's a distinction. There is a difference. And I want to talk about having a healthy spirit. You notice the sign out front. I use the phrase, is your spirit healthy? And I referenced this verse. I wanted to put, is your soul healthy? Because that's what we're talking about this morning. But most people probably would not understand what that's saying. That sign is a witness to everybody that drives by. And there is a lot of traffic on this road. There are truck drivers from 5 a.m. that are driving by on this road. There's a lot of people that comes through here. Is your spirit healthy? What a question. What does that mean? We'll get to that, but I'm talking about soul prosperity and a healthy spirit. And listen, once you're saved, you have eternal life. Now, if you want God's blessing and you want eternal rewards, well, we should do some service. My next point is witnessing. Witnessing. Look at Matthew 16. Look at verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? As a Christian, your number one business is the Lord's business. Your ministry starts with your family and those closest around you. I really do, I am thankful that there are a lot of men in the church that have their own business or a side gig, and not everybody has to have that. You can go and punch a clock. I punch a clock for somebody else. I have a secular boss, if you will. But I can't serve two masters. He knows that church comes first. They won't even bother to ask me to fill it, and it's like, it's, it's Wednesday. I'm not coming to work. I'm going to work for the Lord all day. This, our life ought to be a witness to others because in Matthew 16, you see the aspect of those that are lost, but I want to apply it to those of us that are saved. Look at the verse again. He says in verse 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What good does it do you if you become a multimillionaire and you build a tower all the way to heaven and you gather all the sheep in the land, Pharaoh, and you go to hell? What good? Nothing. What would you give in exchange to keep your soul out of hell? I'd give everything. And Jesus said, I don't want nothing but your heart. I want your faith. I want you to trust me. You can't buy a stairway to heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ is Jacob's ladder to heaven. Angels ascending and descending upon him. Go to Matthew 22. What is a Christian profited if he will build a major empire, become a millionaire, and he gets to heaven and finds out he has no reward? 
That would be a sad day in heaven, wouldn't it? Matthew chapter 22, we're talking about the, wit the witness. Now I want to talk about the walk. If you look at Matthew 22, look at verse 36. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You know, I really believe that you can find the gospel in the Ten Commandments. And I'm not saying you can keep the commandments and be saved. What I'm saying is, when you love God with your whole soul, you understand who He is, and you don't have another God before Him. I mean, to me, that sounds like salvation. I don't have an idol. I'm thankful for God and His provision. I believe in His covenant promises. You know, it's salvation of the soul. And, and when He says, what is the greatest commandment? And, and you know, usually people ask this because they want to get away with something. I mean, because I got this neighbor, and I'm trying to fix him. And if I could just, if I only have to do this one, then I'm justified in doing what I want to the neighbor, right? Look what he says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What's interesting is Jesus gave them one answer. There's one word, it's love. That one word fulfills every single commandment. He reduced the Ten Commandments down to two. The first four are about loving God. And the last six are about loving your brother, loving your neighbor. And he says all of that summed up in one word, and that's love. And here's the thing. If I love you as I should, I'm not going to sneak over in the night and steal your lawnmower. In fact, better than that, if, if you're out of town and I see somebody stealing your lawnmower, I'm going to whoop on them and uh, make them drop the thing, and I'll, I'll sit on them until the cops get there, and I'll even witness to them, right? I, think I, I would defend your stuff out of love. How can I fulfill every commandment in the Bible? Love God with everything you have, and then show that love to your neighbor, because they don't deserve it, and neither did you. Pretty straightforward. If I love you, I'm not going to lie against you. If I love you, I'm not going to covet your stuff. Pretty simple stuff. All of God's laws, I mean, even the ones outside of the Ten Commandments, the hundreds of things He gave, it's all reduced to one word, and that's love. Well, that doesn't make sense in this world. I want money. Well, the love of money, right? The root of all evil. People love money more than God. And we have this problem because, uh, has anybody figured out how to pay the bills without money yet? I mean, if so, let me, let me know. I'm in on it. Let's do it. I would love nothing more than to never have to go punch a clock or show up at a customer's house or to answer a phone and do something for somebody to earn a nickel. I'd love to stay on my land and grow a farm and raise a family and serve the Lord. Well, that day's coming, but it's not here, okay? So until then, we're going to suffer in this world. And even when a wicked government or a wicked neighbor comes against you, we can answer with love and it has greater power than they can comprehend. Now that you're saved and your soul is saved by faith in Christ, you know what he wants? First salvation, then service. Hey, we should be a witness, but how about your walk? The word conversation in the King James Bible, that word, we, when we say conversation, I would say, I had a conversation with Brother Chad. But the word means so much more than that. The word also includes the definition of what people say about you. What is your walk and your talk? That's what conversation means. And so what is your witness? You're a walking, living witness. What are people saying about your walk with God? If you will, go to 1 Thessalonians 5. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you do that, you have fulfilled every single law in the entire Bible. Love God. Love your neighbor. Well, if you love somebody, you're not going to be selfish. If you love somebody, you're going to help them out. If you love somebody, you'll go the extra mile for them. If you love somebody, you'll come to church and encourage them instead of coming, oh, man, did you hear what happened? Man, if it gets any worse out there, I don't know. This is horrible. Don't we have something to be thankful for? Amen. 
1 Thessalonians 5, go to verse 23. I, I referenced this earlier, but I want to read it because now I want to talk about last two things. Sanctification. I want to talk about sanctification. Sanctify or sanctification, as we have it up here, means to be set apart for a holy purpose. We sometimes call this building the sanctuary, this part of the building, but it's not really the sanctuary. Uh, Brother Chad, what's the sanctuary? The people of God, your body, is the temple. It's sanctified, set apart for a holy reason. Now, we sanctify this auditorium. Under my watch, there will never be a rock and roll show. We're not going to let some worldly wedding come in here. We're not going to rent it out to the Mormons for the weekend. Nothing. It's sanctified for God's use. It's his house, if you will. But his house is really your body. So he wants you to sanctify your body. He wants you to separate it and use it for a holy reason, right? Uh, verse 23, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, and the very God of peace, here it is, sanctify you wholly. That means completely. He says, I want all of you to be sanctified because guess what? It's not, or it's not yet, I should say. Look, he says, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Okay, God has promised you he's going to sanctify your soul, your spirit. He says, hey, you're, you're sanctified, you're mine. I made your soul clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he made a promise and he will do it. That's what it says. But your body is not yet sanctified. In fact, I would argue your body is not yet set apart for a holy reason as, as long as you're in this body, in this world. Uh, when you die and you go to be with the Lord, you leave this body of sin absent from the body, present with the Lord. One day at his return, there'll be the resurrection of the saints and you'll get a new body and you'll be as he is, will be conformed to the image of the Son. It will have a supernatural body. It will be a Above this earth's nature, it will be heavenly, holy, undefiled, not able to sin. I, I believe all these things. This is what the scripture says. So then my body is sanctified. Right now, I have to fight it every day. We have, if you will, moments of sanctification. Moments that were filled with the Spirit instead of walking in the flesh. It's a moment-by-moment -moment decision in what you're going to do for Christ. Now, this matters so much. You're saved by trusting in Christ. The Holy Spirit moves inside of you. He wants to clean the house. Sometimes the house is clean, but not all the time. Somebody was sharing. They're not here. I won't pick on them this morning because they're out of town. They, they said uh, some, some family came by and the house was a wreck. They didn't tell me they were coming. And they said, it looks like a third world country here. And it's like, well... You get five kids, and they're all going in different directions, and you're trying to do this and do that. I mean, what do you want from me? You know what I mean? And I mean, if I showed up at the right time at your house, I don't care how good of a house cleaner you are. I can catch it dirty. My wife is an awesome housekeeper. She does a great job of keeping the hearts of the family and keeping things on track. And we still have a dirty house at times. That's why we invite folks over, so we get to clean everything up, you know? Amen. <laughs> We've got to do that more often. No, everybody has moments of weakness in the flesh just as much as your house at home has dirty parts. Maybe you say, I don't do anything to get my house dirty. And in fact, I haven't had any guests for years and I don't put food in that room and this one's been clean for years. Well, let me go look in the closet and see if there's some dust. Maybe there's some dirt in your closet you don't know about, right? We all have weaknesses in the flesh and God wants us to choose to sanctify our flesh Every day. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh. Finally, go to Ephesians chapter 1, please. The last two points, sanctification. And I want to talk about how that we are sealed. How that we're sealed by God. And what that means and how powerful it is. Ephesians chapter 1, if you would, find verse number 12. that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, 
The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, we've already talked about this order of events. You see the same thing in Romans chapter 10. You have to trust in Christ, but if you haven't heard of Christ, you need the Word of God preached to you so you can trust in Him, then the Holy Spirit, then you're saved, then the Holy Spirit moves in. It doesn't happen in any other direction. The Holy Spirit did not move in first and clean up the house. No, the Word of God entered into your ears, and this is how you knew what to believe about Christ so that you could be saved. But I love this phrase at the end of verse 13. It says, Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When God's Holy Spirit spirit came into you, you became a four-part being. You used to be body, soul, and spirit, but now you have the Holy Spirit. You're a new creature. Something has changed. Now, that old flesh is still here. Those old habits. I've seen people get saved, and they were smoking before we got there, and you know what? When I close the door and they go on, they're probably going to smoke when they close the door again. They're not. So, now, I've met some people. They're like, I tell you, I left it all, and I never looked back. And amen, praise the Lord for that. But that's not the case for everybody. Some people have besetting sins that took them years to learn and years to get addicted to, and now it's going to take them some time to unlearn and to break the addiction, to break that cycle. He says, after you believed, verse 13, look at it. After you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's his promise. It is sealed. An example I like to use, if I took a can of white paint and I threw it in the mud. Well, if it's sealed, it's clean on the inside, dirty on the outside, and that's the average Christian. I know you, water, you shake that thing off, you shake the mud off before you come in here Sunday morning, uh, but you still have sin on you in the flesh, but thank God you're sealed inside. You're preserved by God's power inside. He says in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We use this phrase in real estate. I'm going to buy that piece of land. I'm going to give you some earnest money as a promise that I'm coming back. And I'm going to buy it. And I will be back. And finally the deal has completed. And now I have bought the purchased possession. It's as good as mine when I gave the earnest. And that's why God gives us of the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love unto all the saints. You notice what happened next? Now he hears what you say about trusting in Jesus, but he also sees your love for the brethren. We ought to grow up and do that, but not everybody gets that right away, do they? The Christian life is hard work. Salvation is easy, and you can't get there by work. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Last place, Ephesians chapter 4. We've talked about salvation and service. We talked about our witness in our walk. We're talking about sanctification and how that we are sealed. How that we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He says something very similar in chapter 4. Look at verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, what is the day of redemption? Somebody. When Jesus comes back, somebody said, yeah, the resurrection, the day that he redeems you. Remember that holy, that was in earnest? Hey, I'm giving you some money, I'm buying that land. But one day I'm coming back and I'm going to own all of it. It's as good as mine now because we've sealed the deal. But now he says, now th the day of redemption, he made a promise, he's going to redeem you, we'll see him at the resurrection, he sealed you until the day uh, that you sin again, is that what it says? No, thank God for that, because we're all sinners, until the day of the resurrection. He's coming back, he's going to take care of business. Notice how he starts the verse though, he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, I could ask the men by a show of hands, have you ever grieved your wife? And they would either all raise their hands or they would lie. <laughs> sometimes we grieve our spouse. Even though we love them, we butt heads sometimes, right? Well, there are some times that we grieve God in what we want to do. We want to force our way and our will and we're selfish. We don't always see the error of our way immediately. 
Well, but when we do, doesn't it humble us? God's given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into the truth. He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from, from you with all malice. What an interesting list. He says, hey, now that you're saved, you want to work for God? Let's see your walk for the Lord. Now, now he, you are sealed for a purpose. You're given the Holy Spirit so you can do something unnatural, which is to love those that don't love you which is to not gossip about those that you have information on, which is to not be malicious or hurtful to somebody. Look what he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And look, here it is, verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Isn't that cool? I need to treat people a little more kindly, a little more loving. I do, not just you, I do. We all need to work on this. And I need to remember that he has forgiven me for my mistakes, even the one I've, I've forgotten about. So when I remember your mistake, instead of me getting angry and expecting to put some wrath on you, and gossiping about you and having some evil communication about you, I need to say, you know what, Lord, let me just forgive them for this and I'll commit it to you. Let me be kind and tenderhearted, and forgive them just as you forgave me. When you do that, I really believe you have a soul that is prospering. I'm not just talking about soul health where you have eternal life. Is your soul prospering? Do you have rewards in heaven for how you treat people here? I hope so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and I just pray that you would use these verses to work in our heart and work in our mind and Lord, to work in our life. I pray that you would help us to become a more healthy church, not just physically, but spiritually. Lord, I pray that you would help us to love each other enough that we would have this great desire that we would see each other prosper and be in good health in every area of our life. Lord, I thank you for the word of life that gives us this health and prosperity. I thank you for dying for our sins. Lord, I love you. I pray you'd give us a, a good week, a good opportunity to speak about you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.